Legacy Church of Downey. If you are new here, I want to welcome you to our church, where God has a story for your life. And we invite you to begin your story here by visiting the welcome booth after service, where a special gift awaits you. Here at Legacy, we have a variety of ministries that you can take part in. Our young adults, ages 18 and up, meet on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Every Wednesday, we have senior Bible study at 10 a.m. in the chapel with a special lunch on the second and fourth Wednesday. And remember, you can always view our calendar online at LegacyChurch.lit for more information on our upcoming events. Thanks, Jalissa. After service, if you feel led to serve, get baptized, or learn more about our church, please join us at the Next Steps booth. And speaking of next steps, another important step in our commitment to both the church and Christ is giving. You know, the Bible commands that we give a portion of what we receive back to him to whom it belongs. And we should do so cheerfully. So here at Legacy, we have two ways for you to give. First is in person at the front of the sanctuary. And second, you can give online at LegacyChurch.live. Again, thank you so much for joining us, and I can't wait to fellowship with each and every one of you. Now, please welcome our pastor, Pastor Shane. All right, if you are in the youth group, please stand up and go meet your teachers at the back door. So if you're in the youth group, middle school and high school. And now, Pastor Shane. Hello, and welcome to Legacy Church of Downey, where God has a story for your life. How are we doing, church? I know some of you are extremely confused because I am holding a basketball. It's a violation of my code of conduct, I understand. But my son Jesse is a sports kid now. That's right. So that makes me a proud sports dad. And I like sports even if I didn't like them before. You understand? That's right. I got to brag a little bit. My son had a game yesterday. And within like three seconds, he scored a basket. I was amazed. And he was passing, he was guarding. It was a good day to be a proud daddy. But there was tragedy, my friends, before this. That's right, that's how you build a story. See, for every single one of these games and practices, we're told that we need to be at the facility at a certain time. So because my wife doesn't understand the culture of Downey, you know where this is going. She makes us get there on time every time. Something to do with integrity. That wasn't a gut punch to anybody who came late. We're not taking a cultural war on today. Maybe Jesus is. I'm just saying, pray about it. Church starts at 10, just saying. But we get there, and then the game's delayed. So we're already on time, which is already 30 minutes early, and then the game gets delayed. And somebody's got to entertain my son, who's bored out of his mind, and he says, Daddy, I want to play basketball with you. So I have to pray about it, because that takes a lot of effort for somebody like me. And we're out there, and we're shooting hoops, and I'm over it after half the first shot. And he's like, try to take the ball from me. So I'm stealing the ball from him, and I'm getting into it. And then I get inspired. The Holy Spirit came over me, and suddenly I'm a basketball player. <laughs> and Jesse's standing right here, and I go, Jesse... Pass me the ball. Let's work on passes. He's standing right here. And I remember his coach has been helping Jesse understand that he needs to pass hard. So instead of waiting for me to run over to where I want him to pass the ball to me from, he goes, boom! And I have a concussion today. Maybe. Maybe. So if I'm acting a little off, you know what happened. Now, the reason why I start with that story is for no reason at all. No, I'm completely kidding. I think it has to do with a relationship with God 
and religion in Christianity or a church. See, a lot of Christians say things like, oh, well, Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship. I'm like, yeah, that sounds nice. Right? Have you ever heard that? It sounds nice, right? Because people don't like religion and there's a lot of false ones. But I have been thinking about that as I've gotten older and hopefully more mature. It's a big prayer. Maybe a little wiser, another big prayer. But I thought, what does this mean? It's a relationship. It's not a religion. What, are, what does that even mean? Because isn't Christianity the one true religion and everything else is false? And why are we assuming that a religion is a bad thing? See, I think it comes down to this. I think that when we as Christians say, it's all about the relationship and not the religion, I'm concerned that what that really means is, I want to know God, but I don't want there to be any rules in our relationships. I don't want there to be conditions. I want to have a relationship with God. I want to go to heaven for all eternity, but... I don't want to have to do anything in this relationship. And this reminds me of our basketball story. See, I would love to say that I handled this situation of getting beamed in the nose and biting both of my lips and being a little swollen for the game. I would love to say that I handled that with all the grace and mercy that God the Father himself would handle that with. But I went into wrath a little bit. At least in my mind. And I had to walk away and take a break. And I told Jesse, Jesse, I'm never playing basketball with you again. Ever. It's not happening. And then the Holy Spirit convicted me. And I realized that's probably not the right attitude to take. And you're going to damage your son. And you're going to have to pay for counseling. Which I definitely don't want to do. I said, so, okay. When I cooled down, Jesse, here's the new rules. If you want dad to play basketball with you, or if you want to keep playing basketball with your friends, you can't ever pass the ball when you're this close to them again. Ever! You're too strong. Too strong. And you'll hurt somebody. He goes, okay, Dad. Then he went on to score that basket and went, all is well in the world. And he listens to his coach pretty well. So what we're talking about today is our relationship with God and his relationship with us. But really, the religion, the rules that people don't like to acknowledge, and it's going to come down to God's covenants with humanity and our covenant as a church with each other and God. If you're not with me and don't believe that rules are a good thing, I understand we all have a starting place. I didn't like rules When I was younger, in fact, I just kind of made it my goal to break every rule that I possibly could. And I was proud to be a rebel until I realized that rebels end up in hell. I had a big wake-up call. And I came to learn that rules actually protect our relationships. Don't believe me? How many of us are married today? That's good. God loves marriage. Are there rules in marriage? Yes, a good rule is... You are physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually loyal to the person that you're married to. Amen? That's a good rule, right? Because if that rule is broken, what happens? Bye-bye. I'm going to be lonely for like all the Christmases. Or I'll just get into a pattern of doing it over and over and over again. And because now I'm sinfully corrupted, I'm going to look at all these people that I'm with and wonder what's wrong with them. And then maybe God will put a pastor in your life and I'll happen to go, maybe it's not, you know, the 10 people that you were with. There's one common person there. You. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 teaches us this. If we know God and claim to love him, our relationship with him is evidenced by our obedience to his commandments. That sounds like there's some terms some conditions, a religious aspect to our relationship, and a covenantal relationship. So here's the thing about all of us that very few of us probably know. We all, by default, enter the world in a covenant with the world. And hopefully, we choose at some point in our life to exchange the covenant we have with the world for a covenant with God. Don't believe me? Look at what Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says. It says, 
For the mind that is set on the flesh. Now when the Bible is talking about the flesh, this is old language. Most of us don't talk this way. So in a modern context, we can translate flesh as world. For the mind that is set on the world is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. I think we just talked about that. Indeed, it can't. It won't. It cannot. It is impossible. Now, if you read all the book of Romans, which we are going to start a sermon series on next week, you're going to be able to see that all of us enter the world as enemies of God. We are sinful. We are corrupted. We are hopeless. We are lost. But Jesus Christ lived, died, and resurrected to save us. So here's the truth. When we are born into the world, we are entering a covenant with the world that says this. I'm going to do things the world's way. That's our default setting. I don't have to try to be like the world. I just am. And our world is increasingly evil. It's increasingly corrupted. And all of us naturally go along with it. And it's tragic. Why? Because in our sinful flesh and worldliness, we do what the world does unless we are saved from the world. We are in a covenant of sin with the world. But some of us are confused. You're hung up on this world, this word covenant. What does it mean? A covenant is a formal contract between two or more people, usually with mutual obligations and commitments. We don't like that world covenant because most of us don't like using the word yes. Because there's a major lie in the world. And it goes something like this. Saying yes isn't a formal commitment. Let's do a test. Who's ever said yes and then failed to fulfill that yes? Guilty as charged. Some of you didn't raise your hands. I want to know what your secret is. Some of you raised your hand really quickly. Because you know that the altar call is coming. Pastor, I got some sin to confess. It's like, I know, I know. Yeah, me too, me too. Saying yes isn't a formal commitment. See, in our world, yes doesn't really mean anything at all. It means things like, yes, if I feel like it. Yes, if I have time, which I don't. Yes, as long as something else doesn't come up. Yes, Fill in the blank of excuse. That's actually offensive to God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 37 says, Simply let your yes be yes. And your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Here's the truth. About covenants and about our word. When God says yes, he means what he says and he expects us, Christians, to too. Can you imagine what would happen if God told us yes and he didn't actually mean what he said? What if God's yes meant what yours and my yes means? That would be a scary day for all of us, right? So let it be a wake-up call for us as individuals in the church. God said yes through several covenantal agreements that we can see in the Bible. And each of these covenants built on the last to ultimately bring us to what is called the new covenant, the Christ covenant, which is the reason why we are able to be saved by Jesus Christ, the reason why we are in church today, the reason why we can look forward to eternity and know that we are going to be with God in heaven and not in a nice fiery place forever. That's not so nice, in case you were confused. We're going to look at five major covenants. The first one is the Noahic covenant. You can read this in Genesis chapter 9. It goes like this. The world was corrupt and evil, a very nasty place. And because it was so evil, like these people were sacrificing their own children to false gods and doing whatever they wanted to do under the covenant of lawlessness, God found it right to flood the entire earth, according to what the Bible says. And he saved one godly family, the patriarch of that family being Noah. And he built a big boat, and there was lots of animals on the boat. But when he came out of the boat onto dry land, God put a rainbow in the, sign, in the sky and said, this is a sign of my covenant that I will never flood the entire world again. Some of you are like, that's what the rainbow means? Yes. Anybody who tries to make the rainbow mean something else 
has actually mocked God's covenant. It's a big deal. There's also an Abrahamic covenant. God took a guy named Abram. It's kind of strange. God likes to change people's names, but I'm down with it. He later became Abraham, and he said, You are going to be the father of a mighty people and nation. And through you, ultimately the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to come. Abraham had some trouble along the way, but guess what? God fulfilled that agreement. There's a Mosaic covenant. Moses is my favorite leader that we see in the Bible and in the entire history of the world. He had the most difficult job ever. But this Mosaic covenant went something like this. If you follow my commandments as a people, you will be blessed. And if you don't follow my commandments, you're going to be hurting and cursed. And if you read the Old Testament, literally chapter by chapter, it goes something like this. God's people are blessed. God's people were disobedient, and now they're cursed. God fulfilled that covenant. There was a Davidic covenant. How many of you have heard the story of David and Goliath? Yeah. David was also a king. And David was promised that through his lineage, Jesus Christ was going to come and be born. The Messiah, the Savior of the world. And God fulfilled that covenant. And then ultimately, we come to the Christ covenant. Where God promised that the Messiah was going to be born. So that each of us who place our faith in Jesus Christ can be saved from all of our sin. And we can have a relationship with God on earth and in heaven. If God wouldn't have fulfilled what he said yes to in any of these covenants, guess what? No hope for us. So God expects the church to say yes to him and to one another. Because he has said yes to us on many occasions and he has always upheld his yes. So we're going to learn what it means for the church to say yes to one another. And we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2 today. It's really easy, and it starts in verse 1. If there is any encouragement in Christ, is there encouragement in Jesus Christ? Are you sure? Okay. Paul is saying, if there is encouragement in this list of other things, then we're going to do something with it. If there is any encouragement in Christ, is there any comfort in his love, church? Is there any participation in the Spirit? You're like, what does that mean? Is God alive and well and doing work in our church? Yes, he is. And we can see that because people's lives are changing. It was amazing. Like I said, I was at Jesse's basketball game yesterday. I wasn't in pastor mode at all. I was just trying to nurse my very painful nose. And somebody who comes to our church came up to me and said, when are we doing baptisms again? My family's ready to be baptized. That's the Spirit of God's work in our church. And if there is any affection and sympathy from our God, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So the Apostle Paul said, if these things are true of God, then let us enter a covenant with him that goes something like this. We're going to be of the same mind. We're going to be united. We're going to be defined by love for God and for one another. And these are things that we're going to practice. So what do these things look like? God is encouraging. So guess what we need to do? We need to encourage. I don't really understand why anybody would choose to be discouraging rather than encouraging. Would you agree that there's a lot of discouragement in the world? Yes. For those of you who still have cable for some reason... This is not biblical advice, but this is Pastor Shane's advice. Cancel it. You don't need it. And stop watching the news. It's very discouraging. (laughs) It's awesome. Here's what I think should be true of Christians. Because God encourages us. I think that we need to be encouraging to one another. Why is it that we have trouble with that? I know that some of us are more inclined to be verbally filled with praise. Some of us just need to practice. So here's your starting place. Some of you, maybe outside of our church, because definitely not any of you, but maybe some of you, it's easy to be discouraging. And you walk into a place and the glass is always half empty or even completely empty. 
And with all the good things that are going on, you don't see those. You look and you go, well, yeah, but. Yeah, 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 all of that was nice. People got saved. People are getting baptized. Good things are happening. But did you see this person or that person fumbled their words or that mic didn't work well or there's a stain on the, co- well, on the carpet from somebody's coffee. Hey, I saw that today. We just got that clean, by the way. <laughs> but here's the encouragement. We can clean it again, amen? Now, I'm not in your house either, but does this happen in our homes sometimes? Ooh. Man, I wonder. Let's get serious for a second. What would have happened to my son... If instead of focusing on the fact that he made a basket on his team and he played hard and he guarded well and he passed well and he listened to his coach, he was a great team player, what would happen to him if I focused on the fact that he threw a basketball in my face before the game instead of praising him for all the things that were worthy of encouragement? Wouldn't that damage our relationship? Yeah. You know what else it would damage? My relationship with God. Amen. She's with the sermon. Preach it. God is comforting, so guess what? We will be comforting. It's like my wife really helps me with this. It's like Jesse, he'll fall out in the backyard or something and skin his knee, and I'm like, he's coming up to me, Daddy, I got hurt. Boy, you're fine. Let me tell you about my bike accident in 1997. Back in my day. That's right. That's right. I've been, I've been welcomed by the old people. Nobody bandaged my knee, son. And my mom's like, yes, I did. I'm like, <laughs> Whitney's like, she's so good at this. He needs comfort. Well, how do I do that? Give him a hug. Tell him it's going to be okay. I'm like, I did. (laughs) Let's ask this question. If God was comforting like you're comforting, would you actually be comforted? I see people shaking their head no. I know. I'm working on it too, church. But because God is comforting, don't you think we should be comforting too? It's like, look. I've really come a long way, and this is really because of my wife's work in my life. Yeah. We all have different gifts, like mercy, grace, comfort, the things that flow in that line been a little bit difficult for me. And when I was a younger, less refined pastor, it would be, here, Aaron, come here really quick. Let me, let me, let me show you something. So, Matt, give it up for Aaron. So imagine Aaron comes up and he goes, Pastor Shane, I'm just having a really hard time in life. These are the things that are going on. He starts to tear up and I'm like, you have something wrong with your face. Like, chase that back in there. And he's like, what do I do? There was a time where I was like, here, you know what? I got something for you. There, there. (laughs) Farewell. (laughs) Give it for Aaron, not for me, not for me. Lord willing, he is willing. Hopefully, I'm doing a little bit better than that. But we all need to be better than that, right? God works in us, so we will work together. Say that word with me. Together. It's not my job to do everything. I can't. As much as I love it when you see things to do and you come tell me, and I say, oh, are you going to help with that? No. As much, as much as I love it, I really do. It's very encouraging and comforting to me. No! If you are a Christian, God has invited you to participate in his work. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I think that you'll come to a better understanding of this. The Bible uses lots of symbolism to describe what it means to be a Christian. 
And it says that we as Christians are called the body of Jesus Christ. And most of us, we go, that's nice. They don't really know what that means. Here's what it means. Was Jesus Christ born as a human? Yes. And did he have a physical body? Which means he had an earthly ministry. And is Jesus physically here anymore? No. Where is he at? He's in heaven. Jesus Christ is not physically here. Are we here? I know some of you are like, you had to think about that. Elon Musk's computer theory, we're all in a big mainframe. No. No. We can talk about that, though. I love that stuff. But stop being weird. (laughs) Don't let people who are too smart for their own good form your theology. We're not in a computer. We are physically here, which means, guess what? We are the hands and feet and body of Jesus Christ. That's what we've been invited into as Christians. Nobody cares. Amen. Amen. She does. We got one. No, but here's, if you're learning, here's what it means. All of us have a job to do in the church. 80 hours a week, no. (laughs) No vacation, no pay. Every single day of our lives, all of us can represent Jesus Christ everywhere we go. When you're at a basketball game for your son, you can be Jesus to those people. You are not Jesus. We're not going to little God's theology heresy, but you can represent Jesus. Amen? That's right. You got to be careful. I know some pastors who say, I am God. No, you are not. You are a moron, sir. Okay? And you're not God either, but we can represent Jesus, and we should. And then when we come together as a church, each of us should be doing something Some kind of job. Why? To serve one another because that's what Jesus modeled for us. And guess what happens when Christians don't continue the work of Jesus Christ? The church operates like one of those classic cars that's been in the garage. It's going to get running someday. One cylinder is firing, but man, it's not going to the junk heap. Imagine what happens when many hands work together. I've been told it makes like work. Amen. Can we just give a round of applause for all of our people who are serving the church today and every day? You all are amazing. You're representing Jesus Christ. And I'm going to give you a round of applause for when you do this at home. Because guess what? You're at church hopefully a couple of times a week. You're at home every day. And if you're representing Jesus Christ to yourself and to your family, wow. When you come to church, you are actually really on fire. I am proud of you as your pastor, and I know that it's difficult. I have to live with me 24 hours a day. It's hard, man. God is affectionate, so guess what? We will be warm. I literally saw some of our old guys. What do you mean we're going to be warm? The Bible says that Jesus' followers greeted each other with a holy kiss. So because we're not doing that, No, I'm, listen, somebody tries to kiss me who's not my wife, my reaction is to punch first. Just so you know, we are not doing the holy kiss thing. Different day, different time. But shouldn't we be affectionate to one another? It's like, why would anybody want to come and experience Jesus Christ if his people represent him like this? I don't want you to look at me. I don't want you to touch me. No hugs, no handshakes, no fist bumps. And definitely don't talk to me. Welcome to church. Go sit down. (laughs) Sometimes we see this kind of stuff in the kids' ministry. It's like, I'm here to volunteer for kids' ministry. Kids are meant to be seen and not heard. Jesse, go sit down and stop making a mess. Pastor's kid. Thank you to our kids, leaders. I know. Pray for me. I'm at home every day. (laughs) No, we should be affectionate. It's like, I have literally heard stories of people who went to church looking for God, looking for love, looking for something, and what the church didn't know is that that person was getting ready to take their own life because they were so empty. And because they came to the church and somebody had a nice word for them, even not knowing them, gave them a hug, listened to them without responding with they're there 
or suck it up. Pull up your bootstraps. Life's tough. Get a helmet. Welcome to Jesus. Let's be warm. The world is cold. The church shouldn't be like that. And if it's hard for you, you need to practice extra hard. All right? And if you're gross, wash your hands first. And clean your nose. Maybe even shave your nose hairs in there. Bzzz. Don't want to be tickling anybody's ears when you go in there for that holy kiss. <laughs> I wasn't looking at anybody in particular. Don't leave the church. Calm down. Okay, I'm scanning right now. I saw a few nose hairs, but you know, just... God is sympathetic. He's also empathetic. So guess what? We will care about the cares of others. Man, if you're just telling people things all the time and nobody knows that you care about them, why would they care about what you're saying? They won't. It's like, can you imagine if people, and this is sometimes how it goes, they go to a church and there's one pastor who speaks and everybody's in a line maybe trying to talk to that pastor. And what if they don't get to the pastor and they leave and they felt like they weren't cared about? This is why it's important that we work together as a church. It's not about one guy. It's about all of us together. So we all need to share our sympathy and empathy for one another. And guess what? Sometimes it can be hard. It can be really hard. I've been told more than once, maybe more than a million times, well, we're not supposed to keep records of wrongs at home. My wife has helped me understand that sometimes I'm not always the best at handling these things called feelings. <laughs> they exist. Emotions. The heart. The warm and fuzzies. Like when... I step on one of Jesse's toys and it's broken and my foot feels broken. And instead of, you know, caring about his cares, I'm more worried about my foot. Maybe I actually need to care about what my son cares about so that he actually cares about me when I'm old instead of putting me in a home. That's a round of applause, old people. That one was free right there. That was free. You're like, man, I really don't want my family to abandon me. Well, then don't be a jerk when they're young, right? <laughs> Pastor, my one goal is to make it into the end and not just to be in Shady Oaks. <laughs> love your family and they'll love you. There you go. You got to care about them. Try caring about people in the church too. Yeah. That one's really important. God established truth. So guess what? We will align with truth for the sake of God's love. If you're not in with God's truth, you're out of God's love. Period. Like, well, what is God's truth? It's not your truth or the person's truth sitting next to you. Guess what? We were all born into the world in a covenant with the world. Which is a covenant that agrees with a bunch of lies. That agrees with everything that stands against God's truth. So here's the task of our lives as Christians. We want to live in truth and love. By the way, this is why our mission at Legacy Church of Downey goes like this. Our mission is to invite everyone to join us in being equipped to fight lies that still kill and destroy. We fight them with the truth and love of Jesus Christ. Because if we're in covenant with the world and under a lie, we can't experience God's love. Truth and love go together. But guess what? There's sometimes confusion in churches about what truth is. And there are some churches that don't go as deep as others. And that doesn't mean that they're bad churches, by the way. Different churches are called to do different things. I believe that God has called me through conviction that our church is supposed to understand the depth of his word. I'm not really concerned about only the width. Meaning this, I'm less concerned about the numbers in our church than I am about the quality of our understanding of truth 
in the church. Does that make sense? Because I'm a pastor who's been called to equip God's people for the purposes of ministry. And the more truth we know, the more of God's love we know and we're able to share. So let's learn about some tears of belief. There was a guy named Rupertus Meldenius. Wow! Anybody pregnant out there? (laughs) By the way, I'm really going to sidetrack the sermon. You ready? Guess what? If you didn't know, there's a new addition to the Hicks house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for walking through this journey with us. You know that we've had a lot of heartache, even together as a church, several miscarriages. And our little girl... is an unbelievable blessing from God and a miracle. And I'm so sad because we're not having a boy that I can name Rupertus. (laughs) But it could be a middle name. Go take it up with my wife. (laughs) I tried. I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that wants to live in the depths of God's word and that we're in a covenant with God and one another because I trust my son Jesse with you and I already trust my daughter Emery with your love and prayers. Thank you. But here's what the much better name Rupertus, this guy, here's what Rupertus said, and it was brilliant. He said, in essential beliefs, unity. In non-essential beliefs, liberty. In all things, charity and love. A lot of you are very smart and you bring extremely valuable questions forward. Like, why does our church worship and believe in this way? And why does the church down the road worship and believe in a different way? And why is there some debate about some things that we see in the Bible? Well, there are tiers of belief. There are primary Christian beliefs. These are essentials for Christianity. If you don't believe the primary issues, guess what? You're not a Christian. Then there are secondary Christian beliefs that are non-essential. These are debated beliefs. And these are not salvific issues. Meaning that the church down the road that worships differently because of their secondary beliefs, we're not going to look at them and say they're not Christians. We're just going to look at them and say, we're not able to worship together because you hold different secondary beliefs than we do. And then there are tertiary Christian beliefs that these are minor issues of preference. Now, here's what's tragic, okay? All Christians should and have to agree to the essentials of belief that we're going to learn momentarily. But then the tragedy comes because sometimes people make secondary and tertiary beliefs. They make them issues that they shouldn't be. Sometimes they make them primary issues. Sometimes they make these tertiary, unimportant issues, secondary issues. So let's look at them. Here's primary beliefs. You have to believe these in order to be a Christian. This is where you place your faith. The nature of God. If you believe that God is the triune God, Father, Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, you are on the essential path to Christianity. If you believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, in that he is not only a man but also God, you are on the path to Christianity. If you believe in the authority of the Bible as God's word, you are on the path to Christianity. If you believe that salvation comes by grace through faith and is evidenced by work, but not established through works, you are on the path to Christianity. And if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are on the path to Christianity. If you believe in these things and you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a Christian. You have eternal hope. You have placed your faith in the essentials. And you will and are saved for all eternity. 
if you don't believe in these things yet, we have some work to do. Because these are the essentials. This is what makes a Christian a Christian. Now, if you go to a church that says these things are not essential, that's not a church. That's an anti-church. You got to go. You got to get somewhere else. Now, here's secondary beliefs according to our church. Forms of church governance are secondary issues. You're like, what does that mean? There are a lot of Christians who look at the Bible and they are really confused about how the church is to be led. Episcopalian and Presbyterian forms of governance are seen in the Bible. Congregationalism is not ever seen one time. We're not going to explain what all of that means right now, but congregationalists believe that every single Christian in the church, if they are called a member, they have a vote. Let me tell you where the only vote in the Bible was ever seen. It was a vote to not enter the promised land, and it was downhill ever since. So there are Christians who like to go to congregationally governed churches because they like to be in control. But if you are not called to be a leader, you are not tasked with responsibility over the church. Do you understand? Now, good churches, we dialogue, we ask questions, we share ideas. It's not a dictatorship, but it's certainly not a vote because of the definition of pastor. There's a lot of confusion about what a pastor is and what a pastor isn't. Older generations tend to think that a pastor is somebody who spends all their time visiting your house when you're sick. That's actually defined as a deacon or deaconess in the Bible. A lot of pastors normally struggle with things like feelings. And I'm also a germaphobe, so if you get sick or something, don't ask me to come to your house when you have COVID. The answer will be no. And if you're bleeding, put a bandage on first, and then I might pass out when I see that blood. Here's what a pastor is. Actually, pastor is a word that we've adopted from Latin. The right word, if we translate from the Greek in the Bible to English, is shepherd. So you can call me Shepherd Shane if you want. From Bakersfield. It's fitting. Shepherd Shane. But then there's other words in the Bible that are interesting. Overseers, bishops, and elders are tasked with authority and responsibility and leadership of the church. And some churches are confused because they've separated these things. Pastors, overseers, bishops, elders, they're all different. The problem is they're not. 1 Peter chapter 5 unites them. So normally there's a pastor and then there's a staff team of other pastors and leaders who are going to stand before God and are going to give an account for how the church was led. Now, here is as controversial as I'm going to get. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Lord, help us all. No, it's okay. Lots of things are debated about what it means to be a pastor, including the gender of pastors, which makes it even more confusing because there's confusion about gender <laughs> in our world. There shouldn't be. There's men and there's women. And in the Bible, men are only ever seen as the ones who are pastors and overseers and bishops and elders. Women are not called to be pastors or overseers or bishops or elders. It has to do with spiritual leadership that ultimately goes back into the home. I am responsible for the spiritual leadership of my home. I am the man of my home. Now, it does not mean that I get to tell my wife what to do. That does not mean that I get to be harsh and boss my son around. That does not mean that my authority is God's law. Woman, make me a sandwich. Absolutely not. But when I stand before God, he is going to judge me for the spiritual leadership of my home. Now, if my wife was the pastor of the church, and she is my spiritual authority here, there's confusion in the home. Understand? So really, that's what it comes back to. Now, guess what? Men and women have equal value in God's eyes. And if you don't believe that, 
You need to spend some time with Jesus. And women are called to lead and to teach in the church. And to do everything that men do. But there's just a difference when it comes to the role of pastor. Now this is a secondary belief. So if the church down the street believes differently, they're wrong. But it doesn't mean that they're not Christians. Amen? Are we all okay? Round of applause. Okay, good. By the way, if there was any confusion, I'm a man. I know my hair's long, so you can't see very well. We're not confused anyway. Now, there's also different opinions on the mode of baptism. Who was sprinkled as a baby? Who hasn't been immersed underwater yet that was sprinkled as a baby? Okay, good. Most of you have been baptized by immersion now. When we look at the Bible, the preferred method of baptism is to go under the water. Why? Because baptism represents death. You go under the water, it's like you're going into the grave, and then you come out of the water in new life. That's actually what Jesus did, so that's what we're going to do too. But guess what? We're not going to be legalistic here. I almost killed Autumn's Tia, Tia Lete. She, how old is she? 150? 94. 94 years old. She was 93 last year. Our baptismal heater broke. The water was so cold that we almost sent a lot of people to see Jesus. But she was 93. She got in the tank and she couldn't bend to go under the water. And if she did, she was done. That'd be a really awkward service. So I panicked. And I put on my Presbyterian hat, Catholic hat, and I poured water on her head. And I got a call from the Southern Baptist Convention. What are you? No, just kidding. It's not, an, it's not an issue of being legalistic. It's like there are cases like that. And by the way, if you have some kind of health condition and you want to be baptized but you can't go under the water, Jesus is going to be just fine with me pouring water on your head. Amen? We are not a legalistic church. But in our church, if you were baptized as a baby or you were sprinkled with water or you were baptized before you were saved, you need to be baptized by immersion to be unified with our beliefs. There's different views on spiritual gifts. And we're not going to get into it a lot, but a church that I like a lot that we partner with has a different view on the gift of tongues. They believe that there's a prayer language where if you babble that you're having some kind of conversation with the Lord. But when I look at the Bible, I see the gift of tongues manifesting like this. You are speaking in a language you don't know. So a lot of people speak Spanish here. I do not. Imagine if I all of a sudden started speaking in Spanish. Our youth kids really like to make fun of me because I say, quesadilla. Yeah, some of you are making fun of me now too. And they're like, quesadilla. I can't even do it. But it's even difference in pronunciation. But imagine I all of a sudden started speaking perfect Spanish to somebody that needed to hear about Jesus. That's the gift of tongues. Some of you have questions about like Jesus Revolution, that movie. Lonnie Frisbee, the Holy Spirit came on him and then he put his hand on people and then they passed out. Look, God can do that if he wants to do that. But like I can't do that. I wish I could. That'd be really cool. It's like, especially if you weren't very encouraging one day. And it was like, hey, you know what? We're, boom, done. That'd be great. But it really doesn't work. Like, Please don't try to slay anybody in the spirit here. They're probably going to look at you really awkwardly, especially if it's me. Then worship styles. Some people believe, you know what? The Bible says that Jesus sang a hymn, so if we're not singing hymns as a church, we're not actually worshiping. The alternative is also true. You know what? I can't do hymns. I can only do rock and roll or whatever. It doesn't really matter. It's just a preference. I think that Jesus likes all music that's about him. Amen? But you know what? When it comes to a secondary belief... People need to make a decision. Okay, even if I have some slight variances here, can I be in the church and be united with this church because these are our beliefs or do I need to go somewhere else? 
Because secondary beliefs are not salvific issues, but these are issues where you might not be able to worship with one another if you're not in line with the beliefs of the church. Is that a good, gentle, and gracious way to say it? We love churches that have different secondary beliefs with us, but we probably can't come together in service because of those beliefs. Now, here's tertiary beliefs in our church that other churches have different positioning of, but this is where we put them. Views on the end times. Anybody ever seen Left Behind? Some of you have watched the movie Left Behind and you go, that is how the world is going to end. There's revelation and left behind and they are equal and inspired. Not really. But some of you look at that and that's how you understand that the world is going to end. If you were here for our revelation series, that's only one valid position about an understanding of how the end times are going to play out. You might take a preterist view and go, I think all this happened in the past. I don't really know how this is going to happen in the future. You might take a historicist view and look at Revelation and go, I think that all of this has been cyclical and playing out throughout human history. You might take an idealist view where you go, I think Revelation is all symbolic. Or you might take the futurist view and go, you know what? I do think that Left Behind portrays an accurate understanding of how it's all going to play out. And guess what? As long as you don't get super dogmatic about it, it doesn't matter. Because I'm a pan-revelationalist. It's all going to pan out in the end, and we're all going to be surprised. Amen? But there's a church down the road that says, if you do not take the futurist position, you cannot be a representative of our church. They placed a tertiary issue in what I call a secondary issue. And you can form your own opinion about that. There's also a lot of debate about the age of the earth. Some people go, the earth is young, and if you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. Other people say the earth is old, and if you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. And I really like the ones that go, well, Genesis 1-1 was its own creation account, and Genesis 1-2 was a completely different account, and if you don't believe the gap theory, you're not a Christian. Guess what? We don't know. God didn't tell us enough for us to know. As your pastor, I don't care. We can hold all different beliefs and have conversations, Amen. It's like we're not kicking people out of the church because we have different beliefs about a tertiary issue like this. Then there's really fun ones that Ray and I like to talk about, like the validity of non-canonical, extra-biblical sources. So there's a book called the Book of Enoch. The Ethiopian church actually includes this in their biblical canon. They say this is biblical authority. It's not, but you will have different opinions on its validity or not. Because the book of Enoch talks about all the fun stuff. Aliens. Where are my people at? That's right. But the book of Enoch describes something that we talked about with that Noahic covenant. The Bible talks about God flooding the whole earth because everyone was evil and because there was this group of things called Nephilim. The book of Enoch says those were half-breed angels and humans and if you look at the book of Enoch and go this is a valid historical book you believe that there was half breeds running around or maybe still are running around then we have interesting conversations about reptilians and government I'm look, like some of you are like yeah let's go to lunch pastor I know I've watched TikTok the eyelids close this way <laughs> and some of you are going no actually the Nephilim and these People the Bible are talking about, this was just the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain intermingling, and this just represents an unholy union between holy people and unholy people. I think the Nephilim and Book of Enoch conversation is much more interesting than that, but it doesn't matter. Physical appearance. Guess what? If you show up to some church and you're not in a suit or your quote-unquote Sunday best, you're out. If you show up to our church and I can see your tattoo... I'm going to ask where you got it, what inspired it, roll up your sleeve, let me see the rest. Everybody's welcome. You got a nose ring? Awesome. I want one too. Whitney won't let me get one though. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you look like here. You want to wear a suit? Great. You want to look like this? Great. Maybe I just dogged myself. I don't know. Then finally, church aesthetics. Some people look at the church and go, if you change anything, I'm out. Because all of this is sacramental. It's all holy. You move a chair, I'm out. 
Where it gets really bad, it's like, you spot treat the, the carpet, I'm out. That coffee stain has been there since 1950, and it will stay there until Jesus comes back. I remember when I was a kid, and I put that coffee stain. Does it matter what the church looks like? It shouldn't. It shouldn't. Pastor Doug says this. He said it, not me. Send him your emails. He said, if it takes burning down the church to save one soul, we're burning down the church. His testimony is different than mine, just so that you know. He's got a different story and background. But the heart should be there. Guess what? If we worship in the church, great. In the church building. If we go to the park, can we still have worship? If we change the carpet, can we worship? If we get rid of the last pews upstairs, can we still worship? Yes. Whoa, we got, we got some prophecy going on in the church today. That's where we're going to land the plane today. I wish that we had time to say more. Thank you for being generous with your time today. But I find these things to be very important. Because this week, we're going to release a church covenant. Some people are like, well, how do we be a member in the church? And people have been asking me for like for years. And I'm like, I always come up with something clever to say. And really, I'm like, if you come, you're a member. If you call the church home, you're a member, right? It's like if you want membership to mean something more than that, then I don't know, maybe there's some different secondary beliefs or whatnot. But if you call this church home, you're a member. Now, if you want to do things like volunteer and serve and lead a group or teach, or you just want to make a deeper commitment to represent the church, that's where our church covenant is going to come into play. Because if you are representing the church as a visible person of the church who's leading something or teaching, we have to make sure that we're unified, right? Because if we don't, then we're not leading people in unity. We actually position somebody who believes something different and who knows where they're going to end up. So we're going to release a church covenant. I'm going to tantalize you into filling out the covenant because we're going to get some welcome home shirts. And only the people who fill out the covenant are getting that shirt. Amen? That's not called manipulation. That's called wisdom. <laughs> Incentive. That's right. Okay, I've got one no more very exciting announcement. Are you ready? Okay. So I've been praying about our church, and we've seen a lot of growth. We really have. We're reaching a lot of people. And there's a lot of days where people have to leave downstairs and go sit upstairs because we're running out of space. So on Easter Sunday, drum roll please. On Easter Sunday... We are going to launch a second service as a church. Yes. It's going to look exactly like this service. Worship, we're going to have kids care, we're going to have uh, everything that this service has. But the only way that we're going to do it is if we covenant as a church to do the things that God expects us to do. So we're going to need all of us that are willing and able to attend one service and to serve one service. Now, some of you are scared because I preached long today. I'm preaching long today because once we start this, the message is going to be shorter because I want to respect your time. And if I go longer, people won't be able to park. But if you're not serving yet, I want you to leave and to sign up to serve our service times are going to be at 9 and 11. I figured we split the difference there. Some of you are not awake at 9 o'clock. Some of you struggle with 10 o'clock. So we got a later service for you. Some of you are like, it's the playoff games, Pastor. We got a 9 a.m. for you. Okay? But for all of us, we want to create a rotational schedule. We're talking about for things like welcome ministry. It's easy. Sit there and smile. Wave at people. Welcome them to the church. A little bit harder, kids ministry. If you think kids should be seen and not heard, welcome team for you, okay? <laughs> but we're going to do this, so I'm going to ask you to start praying. A part of the way that we're going to use our evangelism budget this year is for the first time in our church, we're going to send mail mailers to tens of thousands of people in Downey, and we're going to invite them. 
That's what we're going to do. Okay? Does that sound good to you? All right. Let's pray and let's worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much, God. Jesus, we praise your name for bringing us together as a church. And Lord, as we're talking about the depth of your word and primary and secondary and tertiary beliefs, Lord, which ultimately are just ways of establishing what we believe so that we can be unified. Lord, I just pray that you would bless our church. God, bless them as they seek to grow in their understanding of your word. God, I ask that you would bless them in the things that are more pressing to them, in their health issues, Lord, in their struggles with their jobs, in their struggles as a family, God. And whatever it might be, would you join them and would you minister to them? We love you, Jesus. It is in your name we pray. Amen.